How far would you go to make an impact in the world? The 10 incredible entrepreneurs will visit our campus to tell their stories and share the steps they took to be catalysts for change. The Entrepreneur Leadership Series, the most valuable one credit class you will ever take. NBC Ironman Broadcast. Believing that no amount of professional success can make up for failure in the home, Brady and Andrea Murray consider the opportunity to be, to be parents and raise their ch seven children to be their greatest opportunity to make a positive impact in the world. In the short time I've known Brady, he, uh, I've just realized that he's incredibly impressive. And not only is he, but his wife Andrea is too. We're, we're very blessed and grateful to have him, so give it up for Brady. Thanks, Mikey. Excited to be with everybody tonight. You guys excited? So Mike said this is going to be a lecture. I got to correct him. This is not going to be a lecture. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. I love Utah State. It was up here where I met my beautiful wife and seven kids later, just trying to create a little vision for everybody. So you got a lot to look forward to. Um, I'm going to share with you tonight uh, some stories, some experiences that are very personal and something that I'm very passionate about. And you will see and you will feel how this can be very much applicable to you because my story in its own special way is your story. And you'll see how that is tonight. I believe that all of us are entrusted with experiences. I use that word very specifically. We are entrusted with experiences. Some of these experiences we ask for, like we volunteer to go to school, or we ask somebody to marry us. Other experiences come as lightning strikes. We didn't expect them, and we are faced with them. It's these experiences that are going to help us to become who we're supposed to become. These experiences will not define you, however. It is how you respond to these experiences that will define you. Let me explain. The title of my presentation is Getting Caught Up in a Cause. I believe that if we allow ourselves to get caught up in a cause bigger than ourselves, we will witness miracles. My first miracle, there I am, Calichin. Anybody know what that means? Spanish speakers in here, the new guy. This is right when I met my wife, Andrea, on the left. On the right, your right, our right, is the day I graduated from Utah State. We were expecting our first child, our daughter. 16 years ago was this picture taken. Our daughter's here with us tonight. It was a short time thereafter when we introduced Brinley into this world that a little bit after a year, we were expecting our first son. So excited for my beautiful daughter to already be in our family. Now so excited to be able to introduce and be able to welcome our newborn son into the family and into this world. I had all of these aspirations on what this was going to look like for our family. I'm a huge baseball guy. I thought of all these ideas and opportunities that I have to be able to take my son and go play baseball. I love the outdoors. And so I grew up in Preston, Idaho. You kind of have to love the outdoors growing up in Preston, Idaho. And so I loved going fishing and I love going hunting and I love going hiking. And I thought of all the great adventures that I was going to have with my son going into the mountains and being able to experience everything that I experienced with my father. Well, it was a hot July night. We were expecting our son Nash at any point in time. And I'll never forget what happened that night. It was about two o'clock in the morning and my wife woke me up and she said those famous words that we all look forward to that we see in the movies. And what are they? I think it's time. I jumped up and said, here we go. We're so excited for this. And she's like, slow down cowboy. Like we gotta take this one step at a time. I think it's time, but we got to take this kind of slow. She said, get ready, grab our stuff. I'm getting ready as well, just trying to mentally prepare for this, and, and we'll go to the hospital. So I'm all excited. I go in. I jump in the shower. I come out. I'm grabbing our bags. I come out, and I see in our master bedroom, Andrea on the bed, complete pain, full-blown labor, saying the words you don't want to hear at that point in time, which is, I think I waited too long to go to the hospital. 
So, being from Preston, Idaho, I immediately jump into Boy Scout mode. I run out into the garage, I grab my headlamp, my Leatherman, I get ready to deliver this kid. Whew. Luckily, it was a really hard contraction, and luckily we made it to the Logan Regional Hospital. At 10.59, I saw my son for the first time. I'll never forget it. I'm filming, I'm taking pictures, I'm so proud of this boy. Can't wait to be able to see what our life looks like together. It was during those first few minutes that I started to notice that the doctor and the nurses, they seemed somber. They seemed concerned even. I didn't think much of it. I was excited in the moment. And about 10 minutes after the doctor delivered Nash, he came over to me and he put his arm around me and he kind of walked me to this side of the room away from Andrea. He told me something that changed my life forever. A lightning strike. An experience that I was being entrusted with. The doctor told me that he believes that my son has Down syndrome. That was the first time I'd ever heard of this, and I wasn't exactly sure what that meant. Here's a picture of little Nash right after he was born. I just know... I felt scared. I felt emotion. I didn't feel sad, but I definitely wasn't overly excited like I was before. I just wasn't sure what this meant. And I started to have all these feelings reel through my head on, what does this mean for my family? Am I, am I going to get to take my son fishing? What's the life expectancy of somebody that has Down syndrome? What are the medical complications that are associated with this? I remember right there in the delivery room, Googling on my phone, medical complications of Down syndrome, life expectancy of Down syndrome. And I remember processing these emotions happening right there. And I didn't know what the future was gonna hold. And then I got really scared because I knew what the doctor told me my wife did not know. And she had just been through many hours of labor. And I had no idea how she was going to react because I knew how I felt. I went over to Andrea and I kneeled down and I looked at her in the eye and I said, Honey, the doctor told me that they think Nash has Down syndrome. She didn't skip a beat. It didn't faze her at all. She said, Great, can I hold my son? And I thought, You know what? Things are going to be okay. This is going to work out. Here's a picture of Andrea in that very room holding Nash. And you can see it in her eye that she knew everything was going to be okay. After a very emotional day, I had family come and, and um, talk to us and, and offer love and support and encouragement. And I was just a wreck. I was crying the whole day. Just not, again, not from a sadness standpoint, but just an unknown Finally that night, things settled in, everybody left. It was just Andrea and I in this little tiny, tiny room. And I got to hold Nash. I got to really hold Nash for the first time. And we were watching a Braves game. It was our first baseball game together, watching the Atlanta Braves, our favorite team. Go Braves, right? Boom. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. And so as I was sitting there holding Nash, um, I was looking into his eyes and I was thinking, you know what? It is going to be all right. We're going to go hiking. We're going to go fishing. We're going to play baseball. That's a Braves fan. Things are going to work out all right. I also remember feeling that there was something unique about this child, that I had been entrusted with this child. And I didn't know what that meant, but I could feel that. Fast forward now, 14 years later. Actually, one cool story. I'm a big baseball guy. I played for the Blue Sox, the Smithville Blue Sox, for a lot of years. And I learned something from my son. When I had him, I was motivated, inspired to try harder, do more. And I wanted to bring him to our first baseball games. This is a week after he was born. He's there. And I got to tell you, I love baseball, but I was not much for hitting home runs back in the day. But I remember feeling something with my boy there. And I hit a home run. And I went and had our, our manager grab that ball. And that's that very ball that I gave to Nash that we still have to this day. 
Fast forward 14 years later, this is last summer. We go fishing, we go hiking. Not only that, but this is in the Wind River mountain range, clear back in the back country, nine miles from any civilization, 10,000 feet above sea level, back there backpacking, and Nash did amazing. He had other, other 14 year olds there with him as well that helped him and that he helped them. It was amazing. Fast forward, we talk about the Braves. I promised myself in 1999, if the Braves ever go back to the World Series, I'm going to go. Sure enough, in game six, when they were beating the Dodgers, when Eddie Rosario hit that home run, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was the sixth inning. I'm like, this game's over. I jump on, and I bought as many tickets as I possibly could with because they're expensive. I was able to get three tickets. Braves win it, and I have all my boys. We've got seven kids, right? And I said, who wants to go to the Braves game? And Nash was the first one. Take me, Dad, take me. I'm like, buddy, I kneel down. I look him in the eye. I go, you're going to the World Series. And this is game three of the World Series with my son, Nash. Going on a little more. It's not all sunshine and rainbows with Nashy boy. Last summer, we went to Disney World. We went in the middle of the summer. Anybody ever been to Florida in the middle of the summer? Nash can take on the Wind Rivers, nine mile high, climbing a bunch of elevation, sleeping out of a backpack for, for three days. But you take him a half a day at Disney World in Florida, whoo, watch out, he hits the wall. But we improvise. Boom. <laughs> I see this picture, and as you can see, Andrea is super excited about pushing Nash around. But I look at this, and I think of Buddy the Elf, because he just looks like a little giant in there. We have a lot of fun. <clears throat> here's, a really fun here's a really fun story. So Andrea and I, as, as they said in our bio, we love to run. We love to do things. And I'll tell you a little bit on why we want to do that in a second. But we got to run the Boston Marathon this last year, which was incredible. If any of you ever want to run a marathon, try and get to the Boston Marathon. It is so much fun. We get done and we get home and Andrea has her finisher's medal. And that's the first thing that Nash wants to see. We get home, he's unpacking the bags. Where's your medal, mom? And he gets it and he puts it on and he's just wearing around like a champ, right? Well, we didn't think anything of it. The next day, he's going to school. We get up in the morning, he's all ready for school. Didn't think anything of it. We go to take him to his school, and he's got his coat on, and it's zipped all the way up to the top, like top, top, right? Didn't think anything of it. Drop Nash off, come to pick Nash up at 3 o'clock. All of his teachers are out with Nash, coming over to talk to us in the car, saying, Nash said he ran the Boston Marathon. He even showed us his medal. <laughs> like a champ, that boy put on mom's medal, and his Hulk shirt, okay, zipped up because he knew mom probably wouldn't let him take the finisher's medal to school, snuck it to school, wore that thing all day like a champ, Boston Marathon finisher. That's Nashy boy for you. In addition to being involved in Nash and, and the Down syndrome community, it was through that inspiration that we really wanted to get involved to be able to help and see in any way that we can to be involved in the Down syndrome community. Because remember, your experiences are not going to define you. It's how you choose to respond to those experiences that are ultimately going to define you. And we didn't want to be just some Down syndrome or some parents of a Down syndrome child that lives in the basement that we, you know, that we take and, and is kind of a shadow to us. We wanted to be involved. We wanted this boy to grow. So we got super involved in the Down syndrome community. And it was there that I had an experience that was trusted to me also that changed my life. I saw this picture. What you see here is a child that was abandoned, that was put into an orphanage and later an adult mental institution as a five-year-old. And this is what happens when that happens. When I saw this image and this picture, I became very emotional. And I felt like I needed to do something to help these children. I started to research it, and I found out that in many developing countries, when a child is born with special ab abilities, I'm not a big fan of disabilities and special needs. I'm a big fan of special abilities, because that's what my experience has been with Nash. He doesn't have a disability. He has special abilities. So when a child is born with special abilities, they are immediately abandoned 
oftentimes left on a street corner and then taken to an orphanage where they spend the first four to five years of their life. When they reach that age of five or six, in most cases, they are transferred to an adult mental institution where they will remain the rest of their life. Most of them die within a year of being transferred to an adult mental institution. You can see why. Well, if you look closely at the picture in the middle, that's a picture of a child that was saved, that was adopted, that a family answered the call to be able to experience something special in their life. When I saw this, I researched it, and I learned that there were many families throughout the world that wanted to be able to adopt, but there was challenges in being able to do so. The financial resources is one of those things. I also looked inwardly, and Andrea and I looked inwardly, and we said, you know what? Maybe we should adopt. So let me walk you through that process. It's one thing to be entrusted with a child that you were gifted through birth. And I gotta be honest, would I have asked for that and volunteered for that, not knowing what I, knew that, what I know now back then? I'll be honest, I probably wouldn't have. And so when the thought came to our mind of, should we adopt a child that has a special ability like Down syndrome? That's not logical. You see, we already had a child that had a special ability. And as I shared the Disneyland thing, it's a ton of work. <laughs> it's not logical to be able to do that. But guess what? Those defining experiences are oftentimes not logical. Andrea and I pondered about that. We thought about it. We prayed about it. And after about a month, we knew we were supposed to adopt a child. And it was one of the scariest things that I've ever tried to do in my life. We started to research what children were out there, and we were drawn to the country of China. When we started to research the children that were in China, we were drawn to this little boy. We inquired about him. We found out that he was abandoned on a street corner of a city of 8 million people early one morning that the locals found him, they called the police, and the police came and picked him up and took him to the nearest orphanage. And that's where he had been the last four years of his life. We knew that oftentimes when you adopt a child that has a special ability that has been in an orphanage, there's a lot of challenges that come with that that are in addition to what you would experience otherwise. But we felt like it was the right thing to do. We knew in our hearts it was the right thing to do, even though up here, it was not logical. So we went for it. It took us a year to be able to get through the entire mountain of papers that you have when you are adopting internationally. It took us over a year to be able to save for the cost of the international adoption. International adoptions cost between thirty dollars and $40,000 to be able to do this. And thankfully, after a year, we were able to meet our son. This is a picture of the day that we met Cooper. He's a jovial boy. I probably should have brought him today because he would have been super entertaining. No lecture with Cooper. But that's the day that we met Cooper. And when we went in there, Cooper was so excited to be able to see everybody and especially excited to be, see his mom. And he ran up and he gave her a big hug. And as you can see, he's sitting right on her lap. And I'm kind of like, I want to hold my boy. So I kind of hey, Cooper, can I hold you? And he looks at me, he goes, <laughs> there was none of that. So I'm like, I got to think quick on this. We were at the orphanage for about an hour and they let us take him to the hotel. I went to the hotel. I'm like, I got to get this boy on my side. And I thought, I know it, pizza. <laughs> I went to the local Domino's because, hey, side note, every street corner in China has a Domino's. Note to self, pretty cool thing. But I went and got me a big pizza, and I bring it back, and I gave it to Cooper. And he is kind of excited to see it. And he came over, and he sat on my lap, and I gave him a piece of pizza, and we've been like peas and carrots ever since. <laughs> it's incredible. All right. We had a great time touring around in China. We spent over, I think, two weeks, three weeks there in China. It was a really cool time. 
And then came the time to be able to introduce Cooper to his siblings. And in particular, I was really interested to see how Nash and Cooper did, because we felt like there might be a bond there. Actually, before I even touch on that, I want to share one very special experience in China. When we were in China, I felt strongly that I wanted to go back to the street corner where Cooper was found. I wanted to take Cooper back to that street corner where he was found and be able to let him have that redemption of him being there with his parents, with his forever family, ready to start his new life. This is a picture of Cooper on the very spot where he was found four years before that picture was taken. That was a tender moment for our family. We came home. Any of you that have been to the old Salt Lake Airport that they tore down know that there's a cool place. It's the escalator, right? And for some of you, you probably have been to that place where you had really cool reunions with family and they got, you, they got all your family roped off. They don't want you causing traffic jams. And we got to the top of that escalator. We look down and we see all of our family there. And sure enough, they're all roped off. We start coming down the escalator. Nash takes the rope and throws it down and comes running up to the bottom of the escalator right there and puts his arms out and just kept saying, my Cooper, my Cooper. And their reunion was that of a reunion, as if they knew each other from a very long time before. We took him home that night, and this is with his siblings, the very first night in our family. And it's been smiles all the time, except for, you know, Andrew tells me sometimes there's some issues, but I'm not seeing it. They're pretty happy every time I'm around. But they have been smiles ever since then. This is a picture of them just this last summer with our family. You can see there that there's a couple more kids that I haven't told you that story yet. And that's probably a story for another time. But these are two little girls that have been entrusted to our family through the miracle of foster care. And we've been their foster parents for over two years, two and a half years now. And our hope is that we get to answer the call as well to get to adopt them. So through this experience, going back, we've been able to help one kid at this time. We thought to ourselves, I bet there's a lot of other families that want to answer this call as well. And Andrea and I felt strongly that if we gave individuals the opportunity to be a hero and answer the call to go through that experience that they are going to be entrusted with, that people would answer that call. So 10 years ago this year, we started an organization called RODS or RODS Heroes with the intention of being able to give individuals the opportunity to come to a crossroads, whether that's through a lightning strike or something that they feel inside, to be able to become a hero and answer the call to bless the lives of other individuals. I want to share with you about a couple of these heroes. There's our logo. The first hero, Mike McKnight. Some of you may have heard about Mike. Mike's a little bit of a local legend. He's an ultra marathoner, and not only an ultra marathoner, but he wins ultra marathons, like by a long ways. Mike's a Cache Valley boy, grew up in Cornish. For those of you that don't know what, where Cornish is, it's a suburb of Amalga, FYI. Uh, for those of you who've been there, you know what I'm talking about. But Mike goes and he runs these crazy races to where he'll run 100, 200, 250 miles at any given time. Most, one of his most recent experiences is he went for the all-time fastest known time running the Colorado Trail, which is over 500 miles, and he ran it in seven days. He did that on five hours of sleep in seven days. This guy's incredible. One that he just barely did is he went and he ran a 100-mile race, and he did it with no nutrition. He only drank water for 118 miles, never ate a power bar, okay? <laughs> never had a cliff bar. This guy's a stud. So he's been entrusted with very cool uh, abilities. We want to know what I think is the coolest ability about Mike. Do you know why he runs? 
If you look close on the back of his pack, you're going to see a picture of a child. And if you look really close, you're going to see that that child has Down syndrome. Every one of Mike's races, he dedicates to raising awareness and trying to find a family for a child. That little boy that's on the back of his pack right there is Brody. And that's a child that we're trying to save right now. You can see Mike wears a cape because I believe that Mike is a hero because he answered the call when the opportunity was given to him. Another one of my personal heroes and a really cool experience that we've had just in this last year. Here's some examples of many of our other heroes that are throughout the nation dedicating their racing experience to uh, the organization. Another one of my personal heroes is Tim Boward. A number of years ago, I was introduced actually from my, from my wife, Andrea, about Operation Underground Railroad, that most of you probably are aware of what OUR does. Tim Boward, their founder, in 2013, had an incredible job with the, CI, with the CIA. He was doing some incredible work to be able to help kids, but he felt called to be able to help these children out of child sex slavery. He felt called to quit his job and start an organization that nobody had ever heard of because it didn't exist. He felt that in his heart. And guess what? It wasn't logical. I've talked with Tim. He's told us it wasn't logical up here. But where was it logical? Where did he feel it? Right here. He went for it. And in 2021, our paths crossed. We did, for World Down Syndrome Day on March 21st this last year, a cool event. We raised some funding. We were able to help some children find some families. And we had an article in KSL get published. A few weeks later, I got an email from a person at Operation Underground Railroad and Children Need Families, their sister company, saying, hey, Brady, can I meet with you? Fantastic. Let's meet. I'm a huge fan of what you guys do. We met. And then a week later, they said, hey, can we meet again? I said, fantastic. A week later, they said, hey, can you meet with Tim Ballard and his wife, Catherine, tomorrow? I'm like, done. Let's do it. Tim came and met, and he explained to us that he is friends with Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins has given a sizable donation, and that he and OUR has followed what we've done with Rods, and that they wanted to make a donation to our organization. They donated a million dollars to the cause of saving these children who have been entrusted with special abilities. Do you know how this miracle happened? Because in 2013, Tim Ballard answered the call with his heart and not logic. Here's a cool event that we did. He also invited us to go uh, to their Rise Up event 30 days later. So he donated a million dollars, which was amazing. And then he invited us to come to the Rise Up event. This is a picture of Cooper up on the stage at the Rise Up event with Tim and Catherine. And here's a little video about the fundraiser that we did. This fundraiser lasted all of about 12 minutes. I want to um, introduce a new collaboration that we have just started with an organization called Rods. <laughs> Everybody, if you didn't recognize Brady, this is Brady who you saw earlier. He's the founder, along with his wife Andrea, of Rods, and Cooper is his son. Because of Rods and because of your donations, we were able to go and rescue Cooper. And now he's here paying it forward. And so your donation makes it so his little brothers and sisters in China and all over the country can be here next year. So thank you. Hey! How much are you donating? 20,000. Oh, we're throwing 20 grand out of my company. A thousand. I'm going to donate a thousand dollars. 20,000. I'm going to donate 20. Here's a check for $100,000. You'll see that when you allow yourself to get caught up in a cause that's bigger than yourself, you will witness miracles. It was not logical for Andrea and I to adopt Cooper. We didn't have the time. We didn't have the financial resources to do it. We already had four children. 
It was not logical, but we knew in our heart it was the right thing. And by going and doing that, do you know who's been blessed more than anything for this? It's us. I will always say that the child getting a family, that's a really good blessing that they're getting. But you know who's getting the biggest blessing? It's the family. It's the family that's getting the child that's going to get the biggest blessing. And when you allow yourself to get caught up in a cause bigger than yourself, you witness miracles. Over the last 10 years, because of the amazing individuals answering the call, putting on the cape, and becoming the hero, we have 64 children who have been adopted and are with their forever families. Thank you. This is the part that fires me up even more than anything. I know of 491 children right now in the world that are eligible to be adopted, that are waiting for their family to answer the call. And this is Andrea and I's life work to be able to find a family for all of those children. This is our life work to be able to find a family for these children. And not only these children, but all the underdogs, all those individuals that have been entrusted with special abilities, because there's still a ton of work to be able to do. I want to talk to you and share with you an experience that fires me up even more, not in the nice way. This last October, there was a child. So all the time I hear, that's great what you're doing for what's happening overseas. That's crappy that that thing is going on overseas. But here in the U.S., we're good, right? No. Last October, a child in Florida, Zion Sarmiento, was healthy had a wonderful family, but he needed a heart transplant. He was eligible to receive a heart transplant, checked all the boxes. Four hospitals denied him a heart transplant that any other typical kid would have got. Do you know why? For one reason, and it's because he has Down syndrome. Zion died right here in our country. There is still work to be done. So tonight, I wanna give you an opportunity to be able to answer a call and to become a hero. Two months ago, I was up on campus and I was speaking. I was introduced to a gal, I'd uh, uh, be careful, not beautiful, all right, so a great student, she is pretty too but a great, great student that came to me and she said, hey, I like what you're doing. I've actually been involved in some things like this and I wanna get your advice. She said, I'm part of an organization that helps individuals with special abilities to be able to get a wish granted. And I've been doing some fundraising and we've helped them get some wishes, but there's one wish that's been asked of me. It's about $2,900 to be able to grant this wish. And I'm kind of tapped out my family and friends. I was going to see if you have any ideas around fundraising. And I thought, Mackenzie, let me, let me think about this. Let me think about this for a minute. We wrote emails back and forth. We talked on the phone. And I said, tell me about this experience. Tell me about this person. And she said that there's an individual here in Cache Valley by the name of Lupita. She immigrated to the United States in 2001. She's 28 years old. Her father has died. She's here with her mother. She was born with cerebral palsy, and she is a go-getter. She said, this girl likes, she has ambition. She has aspirations. She has goals that she wants to accomplish in her life. But the biggest challenge right now is she has a walker that is over a decade old and is really, really heavy. You want to see that walker? It's right here. Just a second, Lupita. <laughs> this is heavy. You see the wood? You see how heavy this thing is? I can barely lift it up. Guess what? This thing doesn't go backwards. She can only go forward. And this walker was holding and is holding Lupita back from being able to achieve 
her goals, and her ambitions. Here's an example of her trying to walk in this. So Mackenzie said, there's a really cool walker that goes backwards. It's carbon fiber. It's light. It will enable Lupita to be able to achieve and realize her hopes, her dreams, and her ambitions. But it's $2,900. What should we do? And my first thought was, here's my Exper American Express. Let's do it. And I thought, no, because this would be negating the opportunity for many to become heroes and get caught up in a cause that's bigger than yourself. So here's the deal, guys. There's over 100 of you here. I'd say probably closer to 150. This is higher math for me. But if every one of you gave 20 bucks to Lupita, she would be able to have a new walker. Who's in? If you're in, stand up. And this is what I'm talking about, guys. When you get caught up in a cause bigger than yourself, you're going to witness miracles. Now, here's what I'm going to challenge you to. If 20 bucks is easy, I've been on this campus when I learned a very valuable lesson. And it was from John Huntsman Sr. himself. He said, give until it hurts. And then give a little more. And so if 20 bucks is easy for you, I challenge you to give until it it hurts, and I guarantee you every dollar of this will go to a cause bigger than yourself. So thank you for being willing to do this. I knew you guys would answer the call. There's a GoFundMe page at the back. Scan that thing and donate that, and I want to show you a bigger call. There's a reason why I have you standing, because I want you to give a standing ovation to our special guest of honor, Lupita. She's excited. Keep it going, guys. Let's go. You got it, Lupita. She says, keep it going. Here she comes. Look what she's got. She's got her new walker right there. <laughs> Let's hear it, guys. How much do you like this? <laughs> you are witnessing a miracle. You are getting caught up in a cause that's bigger than yourself. Keep coming, Lupita. We want to see you right here. Lupita, you see this old walker over here? Yes. You don't have to use that anymore. No. How do you like this new yes. walker? This is my best. Yes. Give it up for Lupita. <laughs> Look at what she can do. This girl's ambitious. Backwards, forwards. Forwards and back. Yes. I also want to introduce you to Mackenzie. Mackenzie's the hero that made this happen as well. So great job, Mackenzie. Very good. Thank you, Lupita. You can go get some Aggie ice cream now. <laughs> Very good. A couple of last comments, and then we'll wrap up and maybe do a couple of Q&A if we have a few, pay, or a few moments. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for being willing to be a part of the miracle that you experience with Lupita. I promise you will have opportunities in your life that you will come to a crossroads. It will not seem logical to do what is being asked of you. But I promise you the most cherished and tender moments of your life will be when you're willing to be able to think with your heart and to be able to answer the call to get caught up in a cause bigger than yourself. Thank you. Do we want to do some Q&A? Perfect. I am actually going to invite Andrea to come up for the Q&A part because um, she She's, she's the one with all the wisdom. So come on up, Andrea. My wife, Andrea. All right, any questions that we can answer? And I promise we'll have you done before 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Who was it? Yes. How did you get started? 
So as Brady said, we, um, we just learned about, we were involved in the Down syndrome community and we learned about this need for um, children to be adopted from other countries particularly. And um, like Brady said, he started researching it out and um, you can tell he has a lot of energy and ambition. And so he, as he began learning about him, he realized that one of the major hurdles that was keeping families from these children was the financial cost. And so we actually began um, not as a nonprofit, just as Brady and I, we said, hey, you know what, this year for Christmas, we told all of our family, we said, please don't buy us any gifts. If you want to do anything or get, it, get us anything, please donate to these children who we're trying to raise funds for so they can be adopted. And we had, like Brady said, when you get, get caught up in a cause, miracles transpire. So we had a friend who owned a car action and sold a car and just all these little miracles that happened. And we were able to raise $20,000 for this child that we had picked by Christmas, and he got adopted just really fast. And so there were just a lot of neat little miracles that happened that kind of um, pushed us towards knowing that if we were able to uh, create a nonprofit, that it would help a lot of families. Yeah, uh, Mike, I was visiting with Mike earlier, and, and he said something that just really resonates with me. He's talking about a company that he's built, and he said it's been a 10-year overnight success. What he means by that, it was nine years of grind and heavy lifting and just one step forward, two steps back, and just a ton of heavy lift, and then all of a sudden something clicked. And that's really what I would say our nonprofit has been, is literally for the first three to four years, like it was a nights and weekends thing for us, like all day Sunday trying to hammer it out, and we did that for years before we had some of these breakthroughs in the last year. Great question. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question was, how did it start? Like, was it the idea born and, and you just ran with it? Or did it small, start as a small seed and then be able to grow from there? And I can touch on that. Um, we really weren't planning on adopting or anything. We had, uh, we had a friend that wanted to adopt. Or we didn't even know they wanted to adopt. We got a Christmas card from them. And we saw in there, you know, they, they hadn't been able to have any children. And we hadn't talked to them for a number of months. But we just felt in our hearts that we should reach out to them and be able to talk to them about this and be, see if we can't get involved some way to be able to help them to adopt. And that's kind of where the idea started of just we felt something of reaching out. And again, it's not logical, but we felt like we should. And so we reached out and lo and behold, 10 years later, here we are. And I'd say we're just, I said this earlier, I'd say we're at like halftime right now. We're up by seven going into the second half. We're feeling really good about what the next 10 years are going to look like. So maybe they'll let me come back in 10 years and tell the rest of the story. Good question. Yes. So I'm a business major, and I've learned a lot about like, building businesses, conventional businesses. How do you build a nonprofit? So beyond, beyond the dream and then working, gr grinding, what kind of goes into making it into an organization and not just the two of you mm -hmm. donating? Yeah, so the question is, what goes into building a nonprofit? Like, what, how in the world do you get going on that? What actually goes into it? And I'll be honest with you, knowing what I know now, I probably would have approached this as a for-profit. Okay, I probably would have approached this as a for-profit. And I, felt like, I feel like I could have grown it faster and bigger and be able to impact much quicker. But that's a, that's a lecture for another, for another day. So, yeah, and if you want to visit with me after, I'd be happy to visit with you on details on that one. Okay. Anything you want to add to either of those? Yes. I would just say for sure it's a process, right? Like nothing amazing ever happens overnight. It's usually like a little series of events or steps, and it usually takes hard work, right? Everything worthwhile takes a lot of hard work. Good. Okay, we've got time for maybe two more. Yeah, so the question was, what do we do? What did we do to build and grow the community? And that's a really good question. 
Um, again, that's, I think that that is a learning process that we've tried to learn uh, along the way. Of course, you always, when you have an idea or are starting something like a business, um, it's easy to reach out to family, friends, or to like your niche or your market. And I think that um, it's the process has evolved as we've tried things. We have learned, um, we've learned like, you know, who, like what communities are, good candidates for adoption and just like what what people would be interested in this and we've kind of had to um just do a lot through trial and error finding our community so i don't know if that's the answer you're looking for but. well it's that concept that when you allow yourself to get caught up in a cause bigger than yourself you're going to witness miracles so create the cause we organized races we've got a race coming up here in logan on march 19th that i encourage you to do 5k so you allow individuals to go and do something that's hard and they come together, and lo and behold, you find a community in that when you get caught up in that mutual cause. Okay, one more question. Okay, maybe two. Ladies first. Is there anything that, say that one more time? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> that's another lecture. But um, what I would say is if you're considering starting a nonprofit, I would first counsel you to seek out nonprofits that are a nonprofit that is a like minded nonprofit and align with them and help them. And to grow with them, help them to be able to grow. And from that, you're going to learn invaluable experience that ultimately will either help you to stay with them or help you to be able to align and create your own nonprofit. It's very difficult to just start, you know, brand new non nonprofit because it takes years and years and years, right? This isn't a six month get quick or get have success quick type of thing. So alignment with another nonprofit would make a ton of sense. Anything you'd add to that? All right, one more. I saw a hand right there. You talked a lot about making decisions of what um, logical or necessarily comfortable. How important is that in your success with this or any other part of your life? You want to start with that? Go ahead, repeat sure. the question. Um, so the question was, he, he said that how important is it for you to um, get out of your comfort zone, right? Is that basically what you're asking? Yeah. So we are huge believers in getting out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, it's our natural human tendency to get comfortable. We like homeostasis, right? Like we like to be comfortable. And so that's something that um, Brady and I always try and be mindful for, mindful of, is getting out of our comfort zones. And it's something we try to do as parents as well, right? Like with our, especially with our two boys that have disabilities. Like, it's easy to get in a comfort zone with them and say and limit them on maybe what they can do, but um, you don't have growth in the comfort zone, and so that's why I think it's so important to get out of the comfort zone, right? Because there's no growth in the comfort zone, and there's no comfort in the growth zone. Amen to that. Perfect. Any other questions? We do have one minute. All right. Oh, okay. Last question. Can I take this one? Tonight, my guess is that all of you have felt something that have come into your mind, an idea has come into your mind on saying, I should do this, or I could do that. And maybe that was related to our organization, and maybe that was related to something completely different, like I should call my mom, or I should write my friend. Or maybe I should start a nonprofit. My guess is that all of you felt something in your heart and had a thought come to your mind. What you can do is you can follow that and you can answer the call that you just received. That will do more good than anything. And if it benefits Rods, amen to that. And if it benefits society, even better. Okay? I'm going to show you one more picture on here. I forgot to show you one thing. Probably my favorite picture in Ash. It says, because anything is possible for me too. And I'd say the same goes for all of us. Anything is possible. Thank you.